Well, good evening and uh, welcome to the British Library. Lovely to see you all here. Um, I know the temptation sitting out in your back garden with a glass of white wine is pretty strong tonight, but I'm sure you'll have even more pleasure here this evening. We have a very enticing and exciting event lined up for you. Um, obviously, most of you, I'm sure every single one of you knows that this is a part of the season part of the exhibition season out of this world, science fiction, but not as you know it, um, which is now entering its last three weeks, or about to. And we have three more events in store after tonight. Just briefly to mention that anyone who was hoping to come and hear Neil Gaiman, Peter Hamilton and others on Sunday uh, and found it sold out, there are now a few more tickets on sale on the website. Um, also then, uh, this time next week, we are celebrating the mind-boggling Stanislav Lem in all his multifarious um, imaginings. Um, and then two weeks after that, uh, Ballard, J.G. Ballard is, is the subject of the final event in the series. Um, so, a fantastic event in store tonight. You will notice by his absence the, the wonderful Brian Aldiss is not with us tonight. Um, he was taken unwell last night, I think no more than that, and was in hospital. It's just a question of a few blood tests and a bit of rest, but he didn't feel able to join us tonight. So, but uh, he's much missed. Um, but we do have a superbly erudite replacement uh, in Paul Kincaid down the end there, and um, the, the full introductions will be, be given by our chair shortly. Um, I'm standing next to Sarah Biggs, who I'm sure many of you will know already. Um, Sarah was uh, Rob Holstock's partner for 30 years at least. Nearly, yep. yeah. And his, uh, his literary executor and has been a, a major partner in putting together this evening's event, which we hope will be a fitting tribute to, to, to Rob and his, uh, his work and his ideas and great achievements. Um, Sarah's also brought along a whole pile of uh, Rob's books, uh, which are available free outside. Well, sort of free, but so donations to the wonderful Science Fiction Foundation will be appreciated. But please do take as many as you want for friends, spread the word, because Sarah doesn't want to take them home again. <laughs> <laughs> um, after the event, we also have the bar open, and we also have books on sale by uh, our speakers, those who've got books and, uh, available um, and flyers for those books who are not available. So um, Sarah's going to say a few words. Hello, I'm Sarah. As John says, I was Rob's partner for nearly 30 years. Um, I just really wanted to jump in very quickly to say a couple of thank yous no more. Um, firstly, to Phil Davis, Professor Philip Davis, who is um, Director of the Eccles Centre for American Studies here at the British Library and who was a catalyst for this evening, um, completely unbeknownst to me and very generously, as Rob has only a rather tenuous connection with the US. Um, also to John Fawcett, the super calm events and programmes manager here, um, without whom none of us would be here, and very importantly, the bar wouldn't be open afterwards. Um, and to the panel members who have incredibly altruistically spent their summer holidays immersed in Holstokiana and woodlands, I believe. Um, they've travelled from miles to be here. Donald Morse from Hungary, Lisa Tuttle from the west coast of Scotland, Steve Baxter from Northumberland, and Paul Kincaid uh, from Folkestone by way of uh, London in the office today. Thank you so much. Um, and I'd also like to say a special thank you to Graham Slight, who has valiantly agreed to be tonight's moderator. A million thanks. Finally, finally, I'd like to thank you all for coming, and I'm only sorry that Rob isn't here to be with us. He would have felt incredibly honoured and completely bowled over, but above all, he would have loved to have been here with his friends. Thank you for coming. John. Okay. <laughs> and I uh, just wanted to introduce... Yeah. Um, should we mention uh, John Clute as well, because of, he was a fantastic uh, supporter in panning this evening. And uh, Neil Gaiman, who's here in spirit, but Absolutely. is actually watching his wife's gig uh, elsewhere in London right this second. Otherwise, he would have been there too. Um, uh, just to um, say who Graham Slight is, we're delighted he is our chair for this evening. He's a highly respected critic uh, and, uh, of science fiction and fantasy. He's the editor of Foundation, the International Review of Science Fiction. He's columnist for Locus, the uh, news magazine for science fiction and fantasy. Contributor to the Science Fiction Encyclopedia, edited by John Glute and David Langford. He's written chapters in many books, uh, many articles, many appearances on radio and uh, more. And his forthcoming book is Doc The Doctor's Monsters, I believe. So he will take it away from me now and introduce tonight's speakers. Thank you. Ron. Thanks very much, Sean. And just to reiterate... <laughs> just to, to reiterate, um, for, from my part, I, I'm enormously honoured to be here. Rob, Rob's work um, 
was one of my formative influences in fantasy, and 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 uh, so it's I'm I, I'm I'm very happy to be here, particularly with this panel um, from from uh, my right, uh, Lisa Tuttle. As, as you may be able to tell from her accent, is, is not from around these parts, but American-born but long British resident uh, writer whose first novel, uh, Windhaven, I think, was back in 1982 with, with George R. R. Martin. I don't know what's happened to him. But, um, <laughs> but who has written many other novels since, including Gabriel, Lost Futures, and Silver Bow, nominated for the Tiptree and the Clark Award, among others. Um, Steve Baxter... Um, Thought by many, I guess, to be to be a successor to Arthur C. Clarke, among other things, author of Raft, Voyage, Evolution, Ark, um, The H Bomb Girl, and most recently the Stone Spring sequence, of which I think the next book is the or the second book is just out this week. Is that right, Simon? <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah, a couple of weeks, I think. Ah, well, um, <laughs> to to my left is um, Dr. Donald Morse, who. Um, I know, and, and many of us would know, as convener for many years of the International Conference on the Fantastic in the Arts, which is one of the really central gatherings in our, in our field every year. Um, he teaches at the Institute of English and American Studies at the University of Debrecen Very good, great. in Hungary, <laughs> um, has written on Kurt Vonnegut, but most uh, relevantly for, for our purposes this evening, is the editor of uh, The Mythic Fantasy of Robert Holstock, um, which you can order, I think, outside. Mm -hmm. And to, 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 to my far left, um, Paul Kincaid, who we're all extremely grateful for stepping in at, at, at short notice, not to replace Brian Aldiss, because I think that would not be possible, but Paul is mm. one of the most well-known critics and writers about SF in, in, in the UK. Um, his book, um, What It Is We Do When We Talk About Science Fiction, came out a couple of years ago, was widely acclaimed, and he also has a number of contributions in the BSFA's booklet about old stock, which many of you will have seen and, and which is obtainable from the BSFA. We hope. We hope. Um, well, the president of the BSFA is here, so I'm sure we can, I'm sure we can <laughs> ensure that you can get hold of this. Yes. Um, what I was hoping to do this evening is take a more or less sort of chronological um, look through Rob's career, which means, I guess, starting with the, the clutch of science fiction novels he published in the 70s, of which one of them is Where the Time Winds Blow, yeah. where, which, fortunately enough, Steve has a copy by his hand with a few passages marked. I you, do. You said this was a book that was particularly important in your thinking about his work. Well, I think so. Uh, for one thing, I remember it uh, when it first came out, 1981. So I was um, in my 20s and trying to write myself, and I was kind of mm -hmm. hoovering up all the SF by the generation slightly ahead of me at the time. Um, and it's, uh, I think it's, it's overshadowed um, um, by Mythago Wood, which is the mm -hmm. next novel and everything that came yeah. on. But, I th but, but what's interesting, to go back to, to read it now, well, I think it stands up very well... Uh, Paul would argue this, I think, very strongly. It stands up very well as a novel in itself, but as a sort of foreshadow of, of what was going to happen in Mythago Wood, it's very mm -hmm. interesting as well. It's, it's a story about um, a colony world of the future, a uh, big colony on this uh, hostile planet where um, time winds blow, as the title implies, which bring relics of the planet's past kind of back up to the surface. And people go out and explore this stuff, but they're changed. They come back changed or they get lost in time uh, in the process. Um, and so, yeah, so I've got some short readings to illustrate mm -hmm. the points. Um, maybe it's far way around here. It's, be it's beautifully written. You, you, a passage about the farrago of aliens that, that, that they have to face. He was... Within seconds, they'd reached the edge of the rift. In silence, they looked at the breathtaking view. He was such a farrago of alienness that Falcon found himself growing dizzy every time he shifted his gaze. His attention lingered on several translucent towers, their enormous heights shaped and beaten by wind and rain, sparkling and glittering in the bright, red-tinged light of the high star. He could see wide, half-familiar roadways, one raised above the ground on steel pillars. This road began and ended abruptly, and it's been shifted by wind and change so it had skewed the web at, mid, at its midpoint. Shimmering walkways trembled in physical, physical breezes, spiral structures that ended hundreds of yards in the air. 
So it's, 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 it's very nice, you know, it's very, it's very evocative. Um, but what are they doing on this, on, the, on this world? They're trying to map, um, to, uh, trying to explore and map the strangeness. And there's a little sequence here where uh, there's a slightly wacko administrator who's got a map on his control room wall. One map display above all dominated the room. A one to 10,000 aerial map of the Rift Valley, all 200 winding enigmatic miles of it, taking up yards long rows across the middle of the wall. The map seemed blurred at first until Falcon realized that each display was, was in fact several views of the valley taken at different times, showing the effects of each of the really powerful time winds that had blown through it over the last few years. The regular geometric patterns that laced the valley were the ruins, the structures of other times and other beings. Uh, so, you know, in some of that passage, you've got the strangeness of the time winds, but you've mm -hmm. also got specific numbers and the scale of the map. So there, it's, it's, it's a science fictional t um, uh, a take on a, a, a fantastic landscape to be, mm -hmm. to be stuck in. Um, so there's this tension between the strangeness and the, and the messing about with the, uh, with the consciousness of the characters on one hand and, the, and rationality on the other hand, which is a, a tension that shows up later hmm. in, 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 in Mythago Wardens and, and the following sequence. Um, the characters are just as complicated and difficult and so on mm -hmm. as, uh, as Rob's characters always are. There's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a word from science, incompressible. An ideally incompressible fluid is like water at room temperature, where if you try and squash it, you can't reduce the volume, it just squirts <laughs> out. I think Rob's characters are incompressible because you can't really com summarise them <laughs> in less than the length of the whole book itself. Um, and what makes it worse is that as they go through the, their experiences, they're changed by their experiences with the time winds. They, 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 they may get lost in there. Even if they come back out, they're, they're changed. And they become addicted, as this little passage shows. Um, Perhaps we should just go right now. People have left Steel City. We should just drive out to the landing strip and wait for a shuttle. What do you think? Lena said, that's the only way. Just up and go. Don't think about it. Don't think of the valley. Just leave. Le Leo, I truly want to leave here to go, go somewhere dull and simple, Earth perhaps, or any farming world. Why don't we do it? But Falcon found himself in the grip of a sudden panic, a claustrophobic sensation, the room closing in, the air straining his lungs, the beast of blood through his head, uh, loud and physically violent. We'll do it tomorrow, he said, and there was no real heart to his words. His words. Why don't we see how we feel in the morning? So they're addicted and they can't get away. Mm -hmm. um, just like Mythago would. Um, in the end, uh, now this is a spoiler, really, but what the hell, it's 30 years old. Um, it, it, it's, it's not really uh, the past of the planet being dredged up. It's a response to, it's kind of an alien entity, semi-sentient, which is responding to the minds of the humans. And uh, here we are towards the end of the book. Uh, I thought you were Chris. Later, you became Lena. Lena saw herself in you at the same time as I saw Lena in you. We see what we want to see, or what our minds want to see. Isn't that right? There might be hundreds of phantoms, in fact, but it's strange no two ever show at the same time. You're a sort of mind's eye symbol, a deep-rooted image, something archaic, archetypal, de the dead returned, the lost returned, which you will recognise as being very like Mythago Wood. Mythago Wood, is, it's a wood, Spoilers again, it's semi-sentient and it responds to the minds of, of, of humans who try to penetrate it. It's a big, massive myth, but at, back out of it comes a kind of... There's a feedback effect between the, the observer and the observed, and, and, and these mythagos emerge, just as in, the, uh, in, in this book. So what we have here is, is it's the kind of raw material, the ideas at the centre of mythago wood, but, but he's approached it through uh, the, the tools of, of SF at the time. Um, and it doesn't, it, it works very well in a way, mm -hmm. but it worked better with Mythago Wood. He found a better uh, way to express it. Paul Kincaid, according to the interview in here, <laughs> spent 20 years pestering Rob with the question of why did you give up SF? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the best answer, as Paul says, is that uh, he, he came across this SF idea, really, which was better expressed through fantasy <laughs> and mythology than through the tools of SF. Although Mythago Wood is very SF like. I, I would say. Can I, um, can so, I come uh, back uh, on this? Almost there, almost there. Almost there. <laughs> and, I, and I just say uh, the, the transition then from, uh, from you know, he, he's finding his way to his, his, his subject matter. Um, I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about mythology and uh, Jungian archetypes and all this stuff, but I would say the most basic insight to why Mythago would work for Rob is that he took all this stuff um, away from the sort of uh, science fictional tropes of the time, the colony worlds and the spaceships and the federations. And he went back to his boyhood, basically. Mm -hmm. you know, it's the boy and the ward and the explorations. And there are passages of Mythago Wood which are like uh, just William explorations, you know, when they, with the two war veterans, mm. 
packing the rucksacks to go for a walk in the woods and so forth. You can see it's, it's an echo of his childhood. There's nothing wrong with writers going right back to the roots, I don't think, and, that, uh, and then it, it worked for Rob. Paul, I think okay. you wanted to say a few things. Well, actually, it, it's just to amplify that point. One of the things that keeps cropping up in Rob's early science fiction is time. Yes. His first, his first character is called Zeitman. Zeit means time. And time runs through all of those three novels, but it becomes more confused, more disordered mm -hmm. as you go through the books. You reach a point when there is a limit to what you can do science fictionally with that idea, which I think he reached with Where Time Winds Blow. The only place he could take that idea afterwards was into fantasy, which is what he did with Mythago Wood. Normally, fantasy is actually... It can play with time, but time is straightforward, chronological. It's easily understood, easily recognisable. You can step into it and step out of it, and you know where you are. In the Fargo Wood, you cannot do that. Time shifts the whole way through the book. But it's not even told chronologically. None of the Mythago book story, Mythago Wood stories are told chronologically. They all twist around and the whole idea is that time itself is is the central subject the central the core of the books about which so much else can be used to explain it i think that's what makes me fargo wood sequence so interesting and it's it's there also in uh, the merlin codex that's also a book which plays with the idea of time as something that is not rational not straightforward, not comprehensible. Could I, could I yeah. say something about this? Um, this is kind of bringing it down to a, maybe a more material level. But I, I think one of the questions about whether you're writing science fiction or whether you're writing fantasy is when you began and when Rob began, mm. um, there wasn't really a fantasy market. No. I also think people looked on fantasy mm. as, well, it's kind of old-fashioned, it's um, conservative, it's, uh, you know, that there was less freedom, almost, in, in exploring things. And Rob definitely went with, in with a science fictional mindset, but because of the, it was just natural to write science fiction, mm. but the, the questions he was exploring, yes, time is something that many science fiction writers have looked at, and he's investigating it. I don't think he so much went into fantasy. I think it was more, he went inside, and partly it was what you were saying about he went back into his past. He also went into mythology, which he was already doing. But, mm. I mean, people have commented, his, his early novels, people go out, I mean, was it, I think Earthwind was the first book I read. And you're on another planet, yet for some mysterious reason, they've got, they've recapitulated the ancient Celts on this alien planet. You know, why are there these standing stones and these megalithic tombs? Mm. And it was almost as if, well, he wanted to write about, well, he did, I'm sure, wanted to write about that time period, but not to write a, an historical novel, mm. not to write a fantasy, but to write an investigative, science fictional, mind-expanding kind of book. And in, in the 70s, that had to be science fiction. But by the 80s, it was starting to, you know, it was kind of, science fiction and fantasy maybe were merging and there was mm. becoming a kind of fantasy genre. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. There's a slight digression, but that's interesting. I'm, I'm working with Terry Pratchett, so I've been reading his books again, trying to work out how his mind works. But it's the same phenomenon Strata, this novel from 1981, I think, was a disc world, but justified science mm. fictionally, you know? Uh -huh. Built by aliens and so forth. All the stuff you have running around on, on the disc world that we know, yeah. but science fictional. Then, then, but then he goes, he, the same thing, he flips over to fantasy, and, and, mm. and of course it takes off in the, in the same way. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, the, but, but if the marketplace was pushing you towards science fiction, that's what you did, no matter mm. what your raw material was. Yeah, because well, if you wanted to get it published, it was, well, there has to be a justification. And also, I just think there is a kind of mindset where you're saying, I want to explore this. I don't want to say, oh, anything can happen. I want mm. to find out what the rules are. Mm. And of course, the further he got into the Mythago sequence, the, the stranger... You know, the, the harder, the farther away the rules get, in yes. a way. You know, you yeah. start realizing there aren't any simple scientific mm. rules. Don, you were nodding vigorously well, at one point there. You know, we're, we're trying to make sense out of a, a career, and mm. uh, by beginning at the, be 
at the beginning, uh, in, in some ways it's, it's misleading because we, after all, can try to make sense of it by seeing uh, the overall work, what, what Holzak accomplished as a writer, as a writer which uh, is a tremendous amount, but it's always rooted in England. I mean, this is a quintessential English writer for me. England rather than Britain? Oh, sorry. I wouldn't, wouldn't know how to distinguish. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Celts. I, I, I look from two father shores at you. I'm sorry, Britain. All right, British. He, uh, very definitely uh, a British writer. But in, in several senses, I, I think what Stevenson is absolutely right to go, to go back into his experience and his background, where the forest was so terribly important uh, to him personally, and to find there really the material which he would spend his life exploring. But the, there's something else, and Ursula Le Guin was the one who, who pointed it out, as far as I know, first, and, I, and I, I think this is also very, very important, and why the shift from science fiction into uh, the fantastic. And that is that he's building on what is a uniquely British tradition. There is no other... Um, tradition of the fantastic, which I'm aware of in, in another national setting, that allows you to do what you can do here, and that is have this unique blend of folk tales, legend, medieval romances, traveler's tales, plus the individual genius. And where it, do you see this? You see it in Shakespeare. And I mean, this may sound very far-fetched when you're starting with science fiction, but I, th I think there is a sense in which Rob is rooted in just some of the great, great traditions that are in British literature, and, and this is certainly one of them. Um, and as far as the time uh, motif is concerned, I, I certainly will second every, everything that's been said, but time is the one thing that we, that we can neither define nor uh, somehow really describe, because the problem is that we live our lives in time, and it was Borges, who uh, pointed out years and years ago that time is the one problem we want, we'll never solve. Uh, we live in time the way the fish lives in water. And if you want to know what water is, don't ask a fish. And so you, you can't ask us what time is, but you can write a story in which you explore what time is. And this is what he did in that trilogy. And one of the reasons why it's still so very valuable uh, today, I, I think. Um, I just want to take a brief sidebar. The, the passage Steve read mentioned in passing that the um, protagonist of Where the Time Wins Bow is called Falcon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And of course, between these SF novels and, and, and the Mythago novels, he wrote a clutch of horror novels <laughs> as by Robert Falcon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think Paul in particular I was going, wanted I was going to, to point out that actually, you know, there is, there is something very personal about the character in, uh, in Where Time Wins Blow. I, I think in, in some respects it's almost the most personal mm -hmm. uh, central character because, because he, he's used his own name effectively or at least he's used one of his pseudonyms mm -hmm. for the character. But uh, yeah, I wasn't actually thinking about the Leo Falcon ones. I was actually thinking of Necromancer, mm -hmm. which, which was, I think, third, third novel, mm -hmm. which I don't like horror. And that blew me away when I read it. I thought it was a wonderful book. Partly because it's a wonderful book. It's... <coughs> It's a wonderful structured story. It's beautifully characterized, superbly written. But also because you, you see so many of the themes, ideas, occurring in there. And you can't take horror out of what Rob wrote. And it would keep coming back. Mm -hmm. Even in the straightforward, you know, in the fantasy novels, in the science fiction, there was always that element of something horrific mm -hmm. happening or about to happen hanging over it. Anything that takes horror out of the equation when you're talking about Rob is missing something very serious, mm -hmm. I think. And it, I, I think it starts with, uh, with, with Necromancer, mm -hmm. uh, which I, 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 I think it's one of the few books that is probably unavailable anymore, but if you can find it, do so. It's well worth reading. Mm. So... That I can see. I can see that you're saying that sort of feeds into the Mythago sequence, and, and, I, and, I, and yeah. I, I take Don's point that 
I now can't remember who said it, life can only be understood backward, but it has to Pretty be lived early. forward. Yeah. Thank mm. you. Yeah. Um, but but that's, the, that's the point you're making. But in any case, in 1981, he publishes this novelette with Argo Wood, I think, yeah. in FNSF. Mm. He then publishes the novel-length version of it with Delance in 1984, mm -hmm. wins the World Fantasy Award, and fairly clearly it's, it's the defining book of his career. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. mm. And I mean, do people remember, as it were, reading it when it came out? Is that... Is that I remember reading the, no uh, the novella mm -hmm. uh, when it came out and thinking, wow, you know, I've not read anything like this before. Mm. I didn't read a great deal of fantasy. I thought it was just my ignorance of fantasy. Mm. I, I discovered later it was because he was overturning everything that fantasy did. But then you read the novel and it, it just... The one thing I find in the whole sequence is that everything builds, everything becomes more complicated the further you go on. Mm. Mostly in... in in sequence books, when you, read, when you read several volumes of a story, you, f you find that by the end it's becoming simpler. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you, you recognise the, the things and certain boxes have to be ticked to, to, to please everybody, including the author, and so the structure of it becomes easier. The structure became more complicated as yeah. it went on. Mm. That was what was so amazing. That's, that's why I find a book so difficult to read and so rewarding reading. Uh, but that was back there with Mythago Wood, the novel. Hmm. Having read the novella, and you suddenly, this level of complexity more. And yeah, it, it was a mind boggling experience. Hmm. I think for, I mean, Mythago Wood is really a very short novel, the whole, yeah. the whole hmm. novel. Yeah. And yet it's one of the most complex short novels because it starts off, it seems like a, a very old fashioned adventure story. We're going to go into the woods, we're going to find these hmm. things. Hmm. And he also. Things happen. You don't get an explanation. Mm. You know, suddenly mm. people appear, mythagos. Then, and it's kind of tricky because very often the one character or another will explain. You know, this is all the explanation of where mythagos come from, but it doesn't explain anything. No. You know, it mm. just makes it more strange. And a lot of the time, I think they're lying because oh. they don't know themselves, <laughs> so they're making up the stories. Yeah. 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 Well, I remember first reading it as uh, um, when it first came out. Following on, I, mean, I thought of Robert's science fiction writer, of course, mm. us, and I'm no great fantasy reader. But Mythago Wood, you, 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 you talk of it as challenging himself, but in fact, it's a very easy read. You know, the, the, the characters are engaging, the, the foreground family, the Huxleys, mm. they've been an interesting bunch, even if Ryho Wood wasn't at the back door, wouldn't they? Mm. And you've, you've, you follow them in, and, and, and you, you, you're drawn step by step into the strangeness, mm. and the shocks come. But because it's so rooted in. Um, I, th I think Rob would say uh, it's, it's kind of European uh, um, wide mythic elements that he draws on, you know, German myths of, of, of castles lost in the woods and this mm. kind of thing. But what you remember, I think, is well, more the Englishness, apart from Gwyneth, mm. which mm. is a, definitely a Celtic sort of element, more the Englishness. It's, it's Robin Hood and King Arthur and so on, and then Bronze Age <laughs> figures. So, and you get these shocks of recognition. It's very, you feel that, at home in a way, you know who these characters are, mm. even as the strangeness is unfolding. I mean, there are big shocks, such as, you know, they, they go on a quest to the centre at the end, Stephen and his, mm. and his companion, and they don't come back. <laughs> that alone is, uh, turns most of fantasy upside down. And I liked, as well, and I don't think I realised realize it until later, it, 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 is that it's vaguely Wellesian. I think Brian, if Brian was here, he'd probably mm. talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. H.G. Wellesian. It's, it's, it's set in 1948, which is about when Rob was born, which can't be a coincidence. But it has something of the of the kind of the, the electrostatic tingle of the scientific romance mm. about it. Mm. The experiments by the father with brain caps and things to try and, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, Steve, and, rem and, 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 remember and, and, in Avilion? Yes. Uh, Stephen goes Steve. back mm -hmm. to the house and the book he finds there is the time machine. Yes. Mm. Yeah. It's central fact, book to the... I've got another reading about that, which I'm going to go to straight away. <laughs> so this, <laughs> so this, is, this is Rob's last book, unfortunately, and it's... And it's, uh, it's uh, uh, the final book in the Mythago sequence. But yes, so the sun actually goes out, brings mm. back a copy of the time machine to Stephen, who's kind of trapped yeah. in the wood. But, but Stephen compares himself to the, to the, uh, to the time traveller. He says, um, so he's discussing this with the sun now. When the time traveller sent himself millions of years into the future, he found a world that was not just different from his own, but reflected the divide in the nature of men, the animal and the intellect. But he fell in love with a woman who gave him a flower. And he went back, Jack said. Yes, the time traveller went back because he thought he could res rescue a brief beauty from the world in which she was nothing, in one sense, but a flower. In the story, you said you read it. I read it. He brings the flower back, an unknown species, but the flower is a dying thing. He has no hope. 
He follows the flower back to the future in the hope of finding a love that can't exist. How can it? There's nothing human in the future world he travels to. That's why I love this book. It implies that there's hope. In fact, it creates a fiction of ultimate destruction, an ending of all that we'd hoped for. Um, but he brings back a flower. So, so here's Stephen comparing his mm. own adventure, mm. really. He, you know, he brings back Gwyneth, whereas the time traveller brought, brought back a flower, and it's very, it's very, mm. it's Rob clearly acknowledging his uh, influences, mm -hmm. I think. There's another sequence where they go around the Palace of Green Porcelain, don't they? Yeah. Yes. A myth yes. Argo clearly dreamt up by Stephen, or, or from, from mm. Stephen's consciousness. Rob was always, this, this is a personal thing, Rob was always uh, very kind about my book, The Time Ships, which is a sequel to The Time Machine, mm. because he loved The Time Machine so much. And uh, so we had a kind of Wellesian connection there, but he, he's, he was nice to everybody, but that's another story. And I suppose, just taking off from, from I suppose, the, the concept of Mythagos, they do come from, or they are explicable in terms of a kind of Jungian unconscious or, mm -hmm. or a mythic imagination, to coin a phrase. Um, how, how do you think he, he made the choices that he did? about how to express that and, and, oh. and, and present it? Hmm. That's, well, Chris, that's an impossible question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and and yep. it, it, it can't be answered. But what's in, intriguing uh, in, in terms of Rob's work is his ability to draw really on, on a world of mythology that extends outward and outward and outward. And so you can create the mythago uh, really, out of any of the world's mythological bases. And uh, the result, well, can be quite complicated. So one of the things that's very different about, about these books, and uh, perhaps this is clearer in Celtica than it is in some of these, but what still, you never deal with one, just one strain. Mm. of mythology. You have the Celtic mythology, Arthurian mythology, uh, Finnish mythology, etc. And, they, and they're all blended together. Um, my, my own belief is that the wood, and as Rob began to work on these novels, and remember we're talking about a 25 year period, so we're not talking about uh, doing sequels you know, every six mm -hmm. months or every other year. Uh, he did that. And he did that for all the hack work that he did. But I think once he hit the Mythago wood uh, metaphor, that he really had found his sort of mother load of stories. And so uh, these, these books are very carefully developed. Uh, they just, I think they must have just gestated over uh, quite a long period of time. And as Paul has said, and I think you know, later we'll talk about, uh, they become more and more complex. And the mythago, the basic metaphor that he is using, becomes more and more complex to the point where in the final volume we are going to have self-aware mythagos, by which I mean aware that they are a created being, uh, aware that, that they are part of the wood. And uh, so this, this last complication, it's, it seems to me, just extends the range of what he is doing and, and deepens the fantasy uh, tremendously. But as to how he happened upon this, I, I really don't know. But don't you think the self-aware thing, again, this is almost goes back to science fictional yes, ideas yeah. or indeed current uh, concerns about artificial intelligence mm -hmm. and the whole mm -hmm. idea of, the, you know, of being self-aware. Can you create something that isn't alive and yet... Yes, but this, goes, this also goes back to uh, mythology, uh, the myth of Pygmalion, the oh, creation yeah. of the ideal woman, uh, you know, Frankenstein's monster, which I think he's deliberately sort of working off against. Yeah, except mm. I think it's just that we're, we've, we've now reached a stage where unlike the myth, you know, the Greeks mm. coming yeah. up with a myth of creating woman or even Mary Shelley, Frankenstein, mm -hmm. we... Maybe if it is, you know, we are on the brink, possibly, of creating self-aware yeah. artificial intelligence. And I mean, I'm not saying that that's what Rob was necessarily doing in the book, but I just think it shows the kind of uh, that it's not a specific fantasy thing. And again, it's the whole science fictional mm -hmm. kind of mindset and attitude feeding into. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's taking a science fictional attitude towards mythology, mm -hmm. you know, and and memory. Um, and I mean, one of the, the things I just wrote down here from Lavendis was, Lavendis, for you, for all of us, is what we are able to remember 
of ancient times, mm -hmm. yeah. which, you know, that just the idea of have, it's all within us. Mm. You know? I, I think maybe Rob, Rob believed this was a real thing. I've got, I've got another little quote. This is from Paul's interview with him <laughs> in, in the little BSF booklet here. And when was it, Paul? Two, seven, 2008? It must have, it was about a year before he died. But so to eight then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, late, so late it, he's being asked about um, um, the whole basis of the mythological world. He says, I'm obsessed with time. Um, this is how I feel. He talks about dreaming. The dream explores its own dimensions. When you wake, a fragment of the dream is there, ready to be, ready to be crystallised in words. But that dream has gone roaming across time rather than space. I sincerely believe that while the conscious mind is moving now to now in the future and can remember the past, the un unconscious mind is engaging with other times, other dimensions of time, and we are privileged occasionally to access them. I do not understand how we do that. It's just a feeling, an instinct, when you touch something primordial and creative at the same time. It has to be the dream, because we cannot do it consciously. Mm -hmm. I, th I think you may maybe really believed that, uh, or theorised, that we do have some access to a shared you know, the mm -hmm. time, the, the way we access time is not just the simple linear way that we, that we imagine. So uh, taking a science fictional approach to it is, mm. is actually logical because you're, you know, you're exploring something that may be physically there in the world. And those sort of questions, I think, take us on probably to Lavendus, both the questions mm -hmm. of what happens to time and, and the questions mm -hmm. of, of, of um, what happens as you get further into, into myth. <coughs> mm -hmm. um, and, I mean... I think it's fair to say La Lavendus was probably the book we talked about most when we were chatting, chatting in the green room mm. before. before. Um, and it's, although it's couched as, as a sequel to Myth Argo Wood, it, it deepens just about everything you, you understand about the book. Yeah. I mean, I, I really, it's certainly, it's my favourite. I'm sure it's a favourite of a lot of people. Um, and when I read it, it just seemed astonishing for a sequel to be mm. actually to have surpassed you know, the first book, because usually mm. people think of sequels as, well, you're going back over the same ground, or, or you're just adding on, or people want another book, they liked that first story, they want something the same. This book is so much not the same, you know, it isn't mm. just chapter two of Mythago. It goes back, only in the sense that it revisits the forest, it goes deeper, and there is, I, I just wanted to read um, a bit from it, because I wondered, I mean, I remembered, I'd loved it, I hadn't read it for years, and rereading it, I really wondered, is it going to stand up, or will it, you know? And I was even more impressed. I mean, the, the, the first half of the book, I enjoyed, and, but when I got into the second half, I just felt it had moved into a completely different, um, different level. It became a kind of metaphysical novel. It was, I was thinking about writers like um, David Lindsay, although Rob was a much better mm. writer than David Lindsay, but I mean, in that kind of, there's something so kind of, um, well, I've said metaphysical already. What's another word? I don't know, spiritual. Um, irreducibly strange, I don't know. Irreducibly strange, poetic <laughs> as well. Um, and I mean, as I said uh, earlier, uh, or in the green room rather, there are quotes from Walt Whitman uh, in here. And very often writers will, prose writers, will put a little bit from a poet and Usually, you know, it, it's good, it's nice, you see what they mean, but they don't write prose that then kind of is on the same level as that. And I really felt that in this novel, Rob was doing something like Whitman was doing in his poetry. And it, it, they seemed to both be addressing the same question, you know, mm. over, the, over, over the centuries. <laughs> so I just wanted to read a, a bit. It was hard to know where to stop. I hope I don't read on for too long because... It's, it just builds and builds and builds, mm. and it goes deeper and deeper. And it's, we've, at this point in the book, it's still, even though we're in the second section of the book and it's become much weirder, we're still on a fairly linear, despite the fact that time changes and they pass through different seasons out of order, um, it's still someone traveling and having experiences and then, um, Talis, who has become someone other than she was at the beginning of the book, uh, finds this castle, which is made of stone, which is not really stone, and she is just, you know, examining it. It's just like all these other places she's been. <coughs> she closed her eyes for a moment only. When she opened them, Scathic's sad body had corrupted to bone. 
The walls were alive with branches running over the stone like veins. She closed her eyes. Images moved inside her. Seasons flew. Birds came and nested, then went to the south. Herds roamed. Snows came. She opened her eyes. A holly tree grew from the place where Scathic had lain. Entangled with its branches were shards of human bone, crushed now, gleaming in the glistening green. The holly shivered. Around Talus the room moved, tendrils of tree spreading along the floor, the ceiling, up the walls, reaching into the air. She became caged in wood. A gentle touch on her cheek, then her arm. Fingers ran through her hair, stroked her throat, gently probed her mouth. She closed her eyes and raised her arms, and the old fingers, gnarled yet soft, stroked her skin, then gripped her gently. She was lifted. She hung in the room, strong arms around her waist, strong fingers around her legs. Leaves protected her, their broad faces covering her like skin. Berries trembled against her lips, and she licked them, swallowed. The fortress grew around her, stone into wood, rooms into glades, fortress into forest. Her body was squeezed, as if between great trees. The pressure began to hurt, and she cried out, and the sound set bright birds to flight in the canopy around her. She was lifted, turned, twisted, and absorbed. In the preternatural green light, she watched oak and elm slide into vision, growing at a fantastic pace, their branches reaching and twining. Hornbeam moved as smoothly as a snake. Creeper twisted, ivy writhed about the mossy bark, reaching towards her, its soft and furry touch tickling as it wound about her skin. Then a harder, rougher feel, her legs forced apart, rough bark serrating the flesh, butting against her, harder, bruising. She squirmed with pain but was helpless in the grip of the renewing forest, and she felt her body entered, a single motion that never stopped, just filled her, swelled out, tearing her apart inside, fingers of pain, shards of agony, curling snakes of pressure, that reached inside to the tips of her toes, her fingers up her spine and round her ribs, rising higher, filling her stomach, then her lungs, then her throat. Stretching her eyes open to see the light, bulging with the strain, Talus helplessly experienced her rising gorge. She was going to be sick. Her stomach churned. The feeling of movement in her throat was torture. It crept towards her mouth, inch by inch. She retched and failed, squeezed, tried again, tried desperately to choke out the stodge that blocked her. It came suddenly. She stretched open her mouth, screamed, then spewed out the great twisting branch. It came like a hard brown snake. It flowed from her. It divided into two, then curled back on each side of her head, bursting into bud, then leaf, to wrap around her skull. Her lips split, her jaw cracked as the branch thickened, then was still. Something fluttered inside her like the tremor of a heart. It was still, then moved again. The forest was silent. She was in its heart. The light was an intense green, and she could tell the passage of sun and seasons above her. Sometimes a fine and fluid mist filled the forest. Sometimes a breeze blew and everything shifted, trembled, then was still. The light faded, leaves fell, and a fine snow drifted through the air, vanishing below her, then green again. I think maybe I'll stop there because I could carry yeah. on. <laughs> she ultimately she has become the forest. She is she is everything. But then when she dies, someone comes along, picks up the dead wood, takes her away, carves her into an image. She becomes something else, something symbolic, oh, out of the wood. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the whole. The whole of the story almost is, is there in that kind of, it's, it's visionary, that's another word. Yeah. <laughs> it's like uh, a kind of, just a vision of, I don't, well, a vision and of itself. It's there in, right from the start as well when she carves mm -hmm. the masks. Right. She's oh, yeah. setting up herself being carved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's, so make, she's creating these kind of mythic figures mm -hmm. and then she becomes herself yeah. part of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, what we really have here is the ancient theme of metamorphosis. And this, it seems to me, uh, plays in very nicely w with what uh, has just been said. Because in addition to exploring time and our strange partial experience of it, it seems to me Rob is also trying to explore the unconscious, as you mm -hmm. were saying, Stephen, mm -hmm. through the use of dreams. And the, the fact, 
I guess what we could all say about our dreams is they do not follow a daytime uh, time sequence and that metamorphosis, shape changing, uh, radical shifts in, in setting are the norm. And this passage here is she is metamorphosed from a woman into Holly, uh, which again is, is right at the heart of, of the story and you know, is the uh, English carol English mm -hmm. Carol has it uh, the first tree in the greenwood. It was the holly, and uh, so here we have the holly tree as the first tree in in the greenwood. Um, this is a, a, a tremendous novel, and, and one that I don't think can be exhausted. And I agree with you. Every reading of it, it seems to me, becomes a new uh, a new experience of it. And um, this is is what great works of literature uh, really can do. But I. I read this as a very tragic book. I, I know a lot of people don't. I uh, recently read an interpretation of it that seems to think it's a very positive paean to, uh, to the womanhood of Talus. But it seems to me that the, the question that the, the book is raising again and again and again is um, a, a question that would be very specific in, in Gate of Ivory, Gate of Horn, and that is where, what is the true dream? What is the false dream? What dream are you following? And at what point do you have to disentangle yourself from the dream if you can? Uh, what if the dream is going to overwhelm your life and totally preoccupy it? Uh, and these are, these are questions that are explored at great length in, in the book, and I think quite, quite compellingly. Yeah. So I, I would put time, dream, and then the third thing, which I, I think Stephen alluded to, with the nature of memory. Mm -hmm. And so we, we have these mm -hmm. three things coming together in, in Holstock's uh, works. And um, you know, they're ancient themes, but they're themes that we can never get enough of because they're absolutely central to all our lives. Okay. Some, something you said about the tragic aspect yes. of it. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, I, I agree with you. And I think there's one of the questions that, that's never answered mm -hmm. in the book is there is this feeling at the beginning she is, something is driving her. And we yeah. learn at the very beginning when her grandfather dies and he's kind of begging some unknown being or beings, let her parents have her a little longer. Please don't take yeah. her. Take me, right. don't take her. But you know, Talis has only been, is sort of only allowed to stay for a short period of yeah, time. And so whatever it is that drives mm -hmm. her, she makes these masks. She is also obsessed mm -hmm. by the wood. People in her family have been, but not all of them. Why? Her, fa her own father doesn't seem to be able to even enter the wood. He sort of stands on the edge and looks in. So it's, it's, very, it's a wonderfully mysterious book, you know, unlike a lot of kind of commercial fantasy, I think, where, where questions are raised only to be answered. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and the book ends, everything mm -hmm. neatly tied up. These books raise disturbing questions and don't answer them because mm. no one can no answer one can. them. Exact, yeah. Exactly, and that's why I think they have this ring of authenticity and truth. Mm. Sorry, the the, the mm. questions about what goes on inside the mind, mm -hmm. which make, I mean, Mythago Wood itself is a perfect model of the mind. It's, it, you're, you're going into that, you're going round and round and round inside your own mind well, all the time. Doesn't even, mm. the, the first forest, there's yeah. a reference yeah. to the first forest mm. in, in Levin. And isn't yeah. that, doesn't, I'm sure at some point he must say, although I, I either didn't find it or didn't think to write it down, but I'm sure there is a direct correct, you know, connection made between the mind and mm. the first forest. Yeah, there is somewhere, and I, like yeah. you, I, I, mm -hmm. I, I couldn't, couldn't say it, where, it, where yeah. it was, but I remember that as well. well I, I actually... I sometimes have this odd, odd idea of reading this that one of the influences on him must have been William Golding, because I keep seeing uh, Ryhope Wood as a sort of externalisation of the mind in the way that uh, Pincher Martin's Island is an externalisation mm -hmm. of his tooth, it's from the inside of his head. And everything in Golding takes place in a very small area but leads to a very serious spiritual quest. And you get the same occurring time and time again in Rob's books. Mm -hmm. and I just want, I, did you read Golding? I think sure. He, did, yeah. Yeah. He, mm. he liked, I, I seem to recall, he said something about the cathedral, is the cathedral, is the it spire. called? He, the, the spire. spire. I think yes. he mm -hmm. liked that one. Yeah. But yeah. I haven't read Golding myself yeah. except for... One, um, one of the other things about Lavendus that certainly sticks in, in my mind, and it goes back to what you were saying about, as it were, 
the, the difficulty of it is the, at least in the first edition, the, the illustrations by Alan Lee. There's a wonderful mm. frontispiece of, yeah. as it were, an absolutely blocked piece of forest. Yeah. And I think one of, the, one of the things that's worth saying about Robert's work is how often, mm. both with Alan Lee and with some of the artists who are, are cycling mm. on the screen behind us, who I think include um, Jeff Taylor, John Howe, Jim Burns, um, how often he, I think, tapped into something for them yes. that, that was more than just a run of the mill. Um, Jim, Jim, Jim is here. Uh, <laughs> 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 I don't know. Do you, I think yeah. there's something to be said about I mean, Rob and I were born within three months of each other, and I mm. think there must be some generational mm -hmm. cyclist or something. I don't know what the terminology is, but certainly when um, ever he and I very rarely met up, actually, it was like once every four years, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, but we almost always slipped back into conversations that covered territory that, well, for instance, we both, we both loved Vaughan Williams. Mm -hmm. And I was telling you, I mentioned the name. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's connections between these names and, and other aspects of Rob's life, I suppose. And, and we just found lots of little parallels. They weren't profound ones that are often sort of revealed in the books, mm -hmm. but they were little parallels that, um, you know, for me, they I'm conscious that time is moving on, and I do want to allow some time for, for questions. But I think a couple of us wanted to talk particularly about The Fetch, mm -hmm. which was a book that came in the late yeah, 80s, think, early 90s. Uh, roughly in the middle of the mythological in, sequence, in, in, And I suppose it's the closest he gets to, to looking at the contemporary world and saying what is being done to it, what is being done to all these things that he values. Why don't you talk about it? You, you, we've been doing the talking. You, you, you talk about <laughs> it. Your turn. <laughs> Your turn. Well, um, I think one of the things that's even in the Mythago sequence about, about the wood as it is, is how embattled and constrained it is mm. in a lot of ways. And, and you're very aware in that sequence that... Um, that there's a lot that could threaten it and that, and that this particular enclave may not last. And it, it's quite deliberately, I think, a period piece. And, you know, mm. one can quite imagine it being bulldozed in the 70s and the 80s to, 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 to make way for some housing estate. And the fetch is as close as he gets to saying, well, these are the kinds of people, this is the kind of... Is evil too strong a word? Um, I don't interesting think so. question. How much of an idea of evil is there in his books? That's a good question, actually. Mm. It's there. If, I mean, but it's not the far the it's not dominant figure is it? in 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 Mythago Wood is mm. sympathetic as much as as much as terrifying. Well, uh, you see, yeah. you see him weep at the end, don't you? Yeah. You even, see him trapped even, into even, this. Even sort of like Christian is unsympathetic yeah. in certain books, and then becomes very sympathetic in. Uh, Gate of Ivory. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I, and I, I think, again, this is, is one of the complicating factors in his work, that we do not have a hero. Mm. And, you know, you were talking about commercial fantasy or, or traditional fantasy where you have a hero and you follow the hero's exploits, etc. But, exactly, Christian appears neutral in one novel. He is a child in Gate of Ivory, Gate of Horn, who undergoes a horrible trauma that he then must deal with. And he's, he there is quite a sympathetic character, mm. I think, in the whole book. But as you go on in the mm. sequence, he becomes almost evil personified. And Huxley, the father, seems to me a very complicated character. Uh, we admire his uh, scientific you know, quest and the fact that he discovers the wood and that he goes into wood and all that. And but one then, assumes the name Huxley isn't an accident. Hmm. No, not at all. Not for, at all. There are an awful lot of significant names yes, of yes, characters yes, in, yeah. in, in all those books. Yeah. I think we could, could run a whole list through. But uh, 
Don't think What's he liked Lacan. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but anyway, so we, we, we start off with a, a, a quite sympathetic character, I think, but by the time this whole uh, sequence gets going and develops, you begin to have real questions about him. Mm -hmm. Is this monomaniacal? What about the fact that he sacrifices his family in order to, uh, to do this? And eventually, of course, in Gate of Ivory, Gate of Horn, you get him implicated in the most horrible possible way in his wife's suicide. Mm -hmm cheering her on, egging her on, even pulling the rope. Uh, and so, again, the, these people are very, very complicated in our reaction to them. You used a word there which I think is significant, trauma. I think yeah. every character, mm -hmm. there is a trauma that is what, part of what yeah. drives them or defines them, mm -hmm. running through the books and... Mm -hmm. The wood, in a sense, becomes a way of externalising, dramatising, shaping that trauma. And I would and say it, it happens in terms of dichotomies. You know, the, the father, he's the most, in, in the first book, anyway, he's the most rational at the beginning. Yes. You know, mm. He's mapping yeah. the wood mm -hmm. and, and so forth. And yet he becomes the Erskamug, <laughs> the most primal <laughs> monster of all. He's pulled completely apart, you know, in, mm -hmm. in, in that way. He's H.G. So Wells, isn't he? <laughs> so it's, it's it's not so much pure evil there. It's more, it's you good side and your bad side, like happened in the Superman story. I think get pulled yeah. apart, don't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and and set up for all to see. And the Avilion, I suppose, the, the red and the green, the brother and the sister. Mm. You, one goes to the centre, and becomes pure green. One goes to the outside, and becomes pure red. Yeah. But you actually, can't, can't go to the outside. Can't, no. It you know reaches a limit and then mm -hmm. is is pulled back, yeah. mm -hmm. which implies that the other can't fully go into the centre without being pulled back as well. Yeah. Yeah. So you never see an evil without a good mirror, you know, it's, it's, it, yeah. people are pulled apart. Yeah. But if, if we went, went back to this uh, idea of trauma, it, it does seem to me, again, this is one of the compelling things about the books. Um, if I could quote Graham Wilson, I came across this uh, just the other day, an early, early review by Gay and Wilson. I, I don't know how many of you know him, but mm -hmm. he's one of the really finest comic fantasist uh, around. And he was reviewing um, one of Holstock's uh, books, uh, The Hollowing, and he says, it's my firm conviction that really good, rock-solid fantasy is distinguishable from the merely entertaining fantasy by being dangerous. And for me, Holstock's work is dangerous. Um, and I mean that in the best sense that he takes us to the brink of so many situations and so many issues. And how to explore that? Well, the wood is, is again, the perfect way to do this because you can create images, metaphors. Uh, a child is in search of his mother who died when he was 12 of suicide. How does he search in the forlorn hope? It's the name of, of the, the group of people going on a search the forlorn hope. So you, you hit this again and again in the books that uh, these searches, these quests that in other works come to a cliche end, come to a very complicated end. He, uh, a character is told again and again, things are not what you, how you think they are. Things are not what they seem. Things must be examined more fully. In fact, you have to examine more fully because you're ignorant of what really happened. And so how do you overcome, say, childhood trauma? And I think Holstock goes at this in, in a fairly complete way. One, the person has to grow up and have enough experience to deal with it. How does that happen? The character goes through World War II. When he comes back as an adult, then he can deal with the trauma of his mother's suicide when he was 12. Mm. Uh, and then again, what is it that you desire? I want my mother back. I want her back. But did you ever think of why she committed suicide? Did you ever consider that she might not want to come back? But this is told through parable. And the parable is uh, the par I, I read it as a kind of anti-Eden parable. You know, we, we all grew up with the story of paradise and Eden. Uh, and it's only as an adult that we ask Wallace Stevens' question, does the ripe fruit never fall in paradise? 
You know, is there no death in paradise? Well, in the original Hebraic myth, death was very much a part of paradise, but it was not feared, it was natural. And so Holstock then has his parable of the land of flowers, a land where everything is in bloom and when the characters move into it, they are in bloom. They become encrusted with flowers, fungi, and all kinds of other good things, into which a character introduces the revival of a dead person. And as the person revives, the flowers die, the land dies. It's a complicated parable, and I'm sorry to oversimplify it, but it, it, go, it takes 10 pages, and I wouldn't dare sort of read all the stuff. But it's, it's a complicated parable, but it's, it teases out thought. The images are arresting, and we, we keep I think as a reader, go back over and over again, and so does uh, Christian, the character who has to learn from this, that uh, you cannot change the past. The only thing you can change is yourself. Uh, and this is a hard lesson for all of us to learn, but here it is in the story, but not as a cliche. Mm. Uh, so anyway, this, I think this mm. brings me back again and again uh, to rereading Holstock's work, because I'm always as I said to Lisa, always having a new experience uh, of, of these books. And the reason for that, and then I'll be quiet, is because I think that these books do what only a very few books do, and that is they don't merely reflect back our experience to ourselves, which is extremely valuable, but they actually add to experience. Uh, and I think Brian Aldous uh, has said this better in, in a couple of prefaces that he did to the various books, but, but I, I take Brian's point that they add to our experience. They give us something new, whether it's new metaphors, new images, new ways of thinking about insoluble problems that we all face. So uh, anyway, for me, this is, this is one of the great, great things about them. I think they, they add to it by being, as you say, dangerous. Very dangerous, by, yes. By, by making sure that there is no safe option. Right. Mm -hmm. Everything carries risks. Mm -hmm. Everything has its problems. And confronting problems might help to solve them, but it won't solve everything. Mm. And that's <laughs> the thing that runs through them. The, things that, the stories yeah. are never ended. They, the, yes. they never end. They never complete. Yeah. Mm. And in fact, a character says, the great stories never end. Yeah. And that's what we're treated to here. Even though, if, even though if we've only got five books in a sequence, mm. the story never ends. Yeah. How much would you say that's applicable to the Merlin Codex sequence, which he wrote sort yeah. of early mm. in this millennium? Well, I know, I know Paul has a, a, a very high opinion of this. I, mm. I have some difficulty uh, with those books, and I've I've tried to give them a, a a really a really good read, but my problem began at the beginning, uh, and it has to do with narration, uh, because unlike the Mythago books, that that are told uh, almost always in in the third person, so you can really get a lot of different point of, points of view, the Merlin Codex series is all told from the point of view of Merlin through a whole series of centuries. And I've, I just found that uh, limiting, uh, whereas I found the Mythago Woods uh, books really exfoliating. But in, in terms of certainly what he is doing in the ambition, my God, it's stunning, <laughs> it really is. Uh, and as uh, Tom Shippey said, this is an incredible mind working uh, on this material. Yeah. But Paul, you... you I, you really think highly of this. I'd love to I hear what do, you I have do, to say. I do. I do rate yeah. them highly. Um, I, I once ventured to, to rob the idea that Mythago Wood sequence was the theory and the Merlin Codex was the practice. Um, in other words, you're working in, in, throughout Mythago Wood, he's working out this idea of the way that different mythologies interfeed with each mm -hmm. other, work, build... Uh, clash, and then he puts it into actually uh, a defined historical context. He he states the date, which mm -hmm. is something you you rarely get. Uh, 
And actually, then you 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 find the Greek myths feeding into the Celtic myths, feeding into the Finnish myths, and everything coming together in ways that show how similar they are, show how closely they relate to each other. They build into into something, and I think he was working towards building something quite original. In mm-hmm. I don't think he completed it. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think there's a fourth volume that he intended. To write and and we don't have it. I know I know he had incredible difficulty writing the third volume. Uh, yes. Um, yes. Very true. Yeah. So uh, it may be that you know there, there was a fourth volume that just couldn't get written. Mm-hmm. Well, what's interesting that in the if I have my sequence right, that in the middle of this he does a villion. Is that Villain, right? No, Villain yeah. came after. Villain was the last. Yes. Broken so, Kings is 2007. No, no, no. no I, yeah, but yes, yes. So I, so I am oh, right. So, yeah. so yes. in, within the... the se- you se- have the three, the and then, we, then he yeah. goes back to yeah. this. Yeah. Now, whether that would have freed him up enough so he could have done this fourth volume, we'll, we'll, we'll n- never know, yeah. and, mm-hmm. and probably... I, th- I think he was, he was... As you say, I'm not sure it was entirely successful, but mm-hmm. I, I think the ambition of that sequence is... In, in some ways, I think it's more ambitious than Mythago would sequence. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think he was trying to do more. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I would it, agree with that. In any case, as you say, Avillian in mm. 2009 was his last mm-hmm. book. Was his last book, right? And um, a death-infused book it is too. Right? It's a, yeah, it's a, it is a huge book. Um, and I think you had some. I mean, partly it goes back to what Lisa was saying about about the way that poetry that he uses in these works is absolutely embedded in the fabric of them. There, there, there's quite a lot of that in, in, in Villian. And you wanted to talk about one particular poem. Well, appended to a Villian are, th- are three poems, and they all have to do with um, different sequences within in the novel. Uh, and let me just share with one, you the first one, although perhaps the second one's title is, is more pertinent to the novel. The title is, He Regrets That His Dreams Are Not Fulfilled, Yet Dreams. That, to me, is Holstock. Yeah. It, it really is. Yeah. Uh, and, and again, we go back to the fact that the, the novels don't come to a, a, a solid resolution. Um, that they don't come to some sort of easy mm. uh, 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 resolution of morality or philosophy or anything else. They, they keep uh, their openness, yet he goes on and he dreams. Mm. And, and so I, I guess I, I would agree with you, Paul. I, th- I think the Merlin Codex theory follows that mm. and that this is a novelist's dream. Now, whether that dream could be realized or not, uh, you know, obviously we're we're struggling with this, and and, and perhaps don't have have an answer. Um, I going back to what Lisa said said earlier. Uh, I am just so aware, uh, uh, reading much of uh, Rob's work, of of how sensitively he read uh, certain poets, and with um, Avilion, in fact, he. He uh, has, has as an epigraph to the novel something which, uh, when I, I happened to be just finishing this when uh, word of his, his death came, and I thought to myself, this may be a case of someone quite unconsciously almost choosing the epitaph for their life. This is from Tennyson. But now farewell. I am going a long way with these thou seest, if indeed I go, for my, all my mind is clouded with a doubt to the island valley of Avilion, where I will heal me of my grievous wound. Now, those lines, if, if, I don't know how many of you have read this wonderful novel, but those lines resonate mm-hmm. in page after page after page. Of of, uh, of the novel, uh, and in all senses, a farewell, uh, but also the the possibility I will be healed of the wounds, but then I may not be. Uh, who is to know? So it's again, it is open ended, and at at the end, 
there is a, uh, a poem about World War I, which he dedicates to his grandfather. And <clears throat> there are, in Rob's work, certainly two uh, great poems, one uh, about his father and this one about his grandfather. And the metaphor is going to be a field of tartan, because when the Scots regiments went over the top, they were wearing kilts. So just listen. And these words come back in, in the book. We get the field of tartan. So it's a meditation also on uh, World War I. The field of tartan. I walked for my life across a field of tartan. The Scots went first. They had it worst. The first, the 21st Highlanders. They sowed the seeds the soft touch of fabric woven earth over which we walked. They had been mown down to a man. They made a field of tartan. Before they went, they sang. The songs were haunted. We joked about their skirts. They took it in good part. There was a sense of peace, resignation, that touch of Spartan in each heart. He walks for his life across a field of tartan. No mud when the top was crossed, when the iron wind blasted and countercrossed, seeking the marrow bone, the head, the heart, taking us down into that field of tartan. It was so strange, so savage, astonishing to find no earth, just fallen flesh, to briefly meet a dying gaze a last remembered highland day, to walk over limbs clared in scarlet tartan. And we slipped and slid upon the patterned cloth, but made the other line. There was killing then, no charms, just arms. The sinking down, the frightened frown, flesh suddenly shaped into dirt, life dearth, blood silt, nothing to hearten us, except our unwanted luck at walking over, hand-weaved kilt, not sinking into earth, walking across a field of tartan. Thank you. Yes. Um, yeah, um, thank you. I'm, as I say, acutely conscious that, that we're, we're, we, we're, 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 we've taken longer on all this <laughs> than, than, than I was hoping. So what I'd like to do is just ask the panel one last question and then throw it up to the audience and I I think I'm right in saying that everyone here knew, knew Rob to, to, to mm -hmm. some extent and I, I just very briefly if I can ask you to share what you remember of him and, and, and what sort of a person he was for those those of us those who didn't know him oh you could do that all evening yeah. I mean, <laughs> this is, I, I, I was hoping there would be more time yeah mm. to kind of share memories but uh, I was just thinking when I first met Rob, which was mm -hmm. back in, in 1979, and we started talking. He was immediately just so friendly and so open, and I think almost anyone who's ever met him just found him immediately friendly and never, but uh, not superficial at all. You know, you would very quickly get to um, <coughs> talking seriously or talking, I mean, joking, laughing a lot. And he used to say, because of because I'm an American and therefore deficient in a sense of irony, or uh, that he would sometimes say, I feel like I need to hold up a sign saying, joke, joke. You know? <laughs> so sometimes I took things he said as a joke, as uh, totally seriously, uh, when maybe I shouldn't. Um, but I remember meeting him, and we started talking about writing, and it was this was before, um, of course, before Mythago Wood, before mm. the, the short story even. But talking about time, memory, at one point, he said, "Are we writing the same book?" Well, of course, <laughs> of course, we weren't. We were. I was. I was not coming at it from the the whole British. But it was there. There was that feeling of connection, and it was mm. very. And I know Rob had so many friends. And and mm. uh, anyway, yeah. It was, yeah. Well, for me, I met Rob in sometime in the late eighties at a Mexico in one of those mm. um, in Nottingham, I think. And he published me in uh, those anthologies, other Edens, mm -hmm. and it was only my third or fourth or fifth. Professional sales, mm. so it was one of you know it was a it was a it was a very useful for me and uh, he and uh, Chris Evans gave me good editorial feedback I remember, but crucially he, he gave me a contact with Malcolm Edwards who's sitting over there, I can't remember if he he said Malcolm would like your stuff you know you should send him a proposal, 
well, 20 years later, you know... Uh, so Rob was responsible Rob. for your career in mm. some sense. Yeah. <laughs> you see, Rob was incredibly generous. He had no reason to do that. He didn't know me from Adam, but there you are. You know, he, mm. he was like that. And, and, and we're coming to sort of the end, you know, the great, great sense of loss. I mean, reading Avillian, I, I think one thing in Avillian, a very basic observation is that he does seem to go back and, 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 and give fully explicit credit to various sources. So the time mm. machine and Wells we talked about. Mm. But there's a sequence in the... Mm. Uh, the Field of Tartan, there's a sequence in, 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 in here where... Isabel and uh, Odysseus, I think, are in the Palace of Green Porcelain, and they see the painting of the Field of Tartan on yeah. the wall. Oh, yeah. So that's and that's the link to the poem at the end and the grandfather. And I believe the next project was going to be a novel about the grandfather uh, in the First World War. Yeah, he, he, spoke, he spoke to me a bit, a bit about that once, and he, he had this image, of, a story from the, that experience of the grandfather crawling across a field yeah. in a wood that was being shelled, surrounded by splinters and bits of bark. So mm. the forest, and you know, is all mm. very primal for Rob, I think, that mm. stuff. But what it, well, it won't be written. Mm. Yeah. Don? Well, <clears throat> I met uh, Rob, thanks to Brian Aldous. As you mentioned, I've been uh, in charge of the, this international conference on the fantastic of, in the arts for some 28 years now. And back in the 90s, uh, Brian Aldous <laughs> said, we should invite Robert Holstock. Well, I had no clue who he was, but we invited him. He was a wonderful guest, absolutely delightful. So I may be the only person here who came to his work through hearing him read. And I, w I went along to the reading, and he read a work in progress, which actually I think would turn out to be Gate of Ivory, Gate of Horn. Rob um, was somewhat leery of automobiles. And uh, at another conference where he came back, he'd been sitting out at the pool bar, and some local pickpocket had managed to uh, make off with his wallet and, worst of all, um, <clears throat> with his passport. This meant he was now trapped in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, uh, because he, while he could roam the country, he could not leave and get back to Britain. So I started making frantic calls, managed to rearrange his, his flight, and then called the British Council, which for me was an eye-opener because it wasn't in Miami, it was in Orlando, uh, which sort of shows the values of both countries. Uh, but in any case, they said if he can get here before 10 minutes of 4 on Monday, we will issue him a temporary passport. So I went and rented a car, and I said to Rob, now, you have to be navigator. I'll drive, but you navigate. And so immediately going out of the rental car lot, we got on the highway, and about a half hour later, I discovered we were in Alligator Alley, which meant we were going south <laughs> and now west instead of north. So at the next exit, I turned around, and we fastened the seat belts, and I put the pedal to the metal. I, I like to think of myself as a safe and conservative driver, but I really uh, looked a lot in the rearview mirror. And I, did not tr I tried not to look at the poor guy next to me who was blanching on the whole distance. And he still, I think, talked about this much later as the ride of terror. Uh, but we did make it. We got there, I think, at 12 minutes to 4. And he got his passport, and uh, on Tuesday he got on the plane and, and went back, and all ended happily. But uh, we, he was a wonderful guest. And uh, a delightful person, as Lisa has said, to, uh, to be around. And, and I think uh, we really valued him, as did a lot of people. And, and uh, anyway, that's sort of my acquaintance. Paul. Uh, I can't remember when I first met Rob. It was sometime in the second half of the 70s. God knows how many parties we were at together. Yeah. God knows how much alcohol we consumed at the time. Uh, but the one thing I do remember about him was laughing. Uh, there was a time when he was having trouble with uh, the third part of the Merlin Codex. Mm -hmm. And I ran into him at a publisher's party. And I remember him spending ages talking to me about this writer's block he'd got and how he couldn't do the book. And he was laughing the whole time. <laughs> There's one other thing that actually isn't directly about Rob, but I think it, about a year after he died, I was reading uh, John Fowles' essay, The Tree. And there's a part in that where he says he, he, he was told about this primeval forest 
in, I think it's Cornwall or Devon, but somewhere in the West Country. Wistman's Wood, possibly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you know, I built went. it all up and, and went there and suddenly found that the, these ancient oaks were no higher than his knee. <laughs> and I just couldn't help thinking of Rob when I read that. I thought that would be a perfect Rob Holstock would. I'm sure he went. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm conscious, as I say, it's five to eight, but I'm just wondering if... Is, I can't see John in the audience, whether we can get uh, permission for an extension. I'm seeing, I'm seeing a, a, a... Five minutes. Five minutes, OK. Um, quick questions I, and short I'd, answers. I'd like then to invite some really quick questions or comments or memories or, or whatever you would like to share about what we've been saying or, or even disagreements. Um, unless... Have we stunned you all into silence? <laughs> that would be a Simon. I mean, it, it, it's been a fascinating discussion. Um, there's a microphone there. there, there there's a, sorry, there's a mic about to find you. Um, it's been a fascinating discussion and seeing Rob in the context of science fiction and fantasy and, and myth and, re and writing about time. I just wondered if it is useful to... Um, uh, if anything can be taken from seeing him as... Uh, a part of a, a fairly loose tradition of English writers writing about landscape, you know, whether it be um, Henry Williamson or T.H. White or even Kenneth Graham. You know, there's a, it, it, it seems to me he's so steeped in, yeah. and I think specifically in English landscape. Um, mm. And I, I have a very strong sense of him personally as a writer who's directly in that tradition and, and mm. you know, and, and whether it's useful to see him as, as a part of that. Yeah. Well, the, the other name, if I can just suggest, to add to that, who blurbed Rob's books and who, at one point, we, we hoped we might get here, was Alan Garner, yeah. who I don't think we've mentioned up to this point, but, but mm. there's an awful lot in yeah. common there. Mm. I mean, definitely. Um, the one thing you, you cannot read the books without doing is getting a sense of land. The, the, the whole setting is a stronger character as anything, and it's... It is a very English thing. Um, I know that he made references to uh, Irish landscapes, in, particularly in some of his early short stories, and uh, I think very likely Welsh. I'm not so sure of Scotland. I don't remember any of that. Yeah. There was no. something where I remember yeah. there was something about a Cranach mm. in Scotland in one of but, the books. But, but yeah. Because but he loved the whole Celtic there, yeah. thing, mm. but, yeah. but yes, but he was English mm. through and through. And it was, yeah, it so. was English through and through. Yeah. Uh, the, the discussion about Rob that features in that, uh, that BSFA booklet also talked about how steeped he was in a, a very traditional type of, well, English schooling. A lot of the references of the things that schoolboys of mm -hmm. his generation would mm -hmm. have picked up. These are the myths we were told. These mm -hmm. are the stories we, that we, we read. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's that very generational thing in his writing also. Mm -hmm. Steve, you wanted... No, that was exactly the point I was yeah. going to make, actually. Okay. Yeah, it, was, it, was the, it, was, it was the English landscape as apprehended by an Englishman of his generation. Mm -hmm. Which, if you think of the way the mythago process actually works, is logical. You know, you would expect yeah. to see Robin mm -hmm. Hood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we had another question down there. It connects with the idea of landscape writers. Us, to me, there's quite a strong influence of J.G. Ballard in his writing that comes through in the sense of kind of using the landscape as an external expression of people's um, subconscious, um, particularly mm -hmm. on a kind of mythological, <laughs> primitive sort of level. And there's a particular story in the Bone Forest collection, the last story, I can't remember the title of it, about scientists doing some investigation. It's a very Ballardian sort of story. I wonder if anyone else on the panel has any opinions about that uh, connection. I'm not sure about that landscape and Ballard, but, but Ballard's views on time and how there's an essay somewhere about Ballard um, uh, uh, being very dismissive of the way most SF writers like me use time and time travel. But he, and he talked about fragmented time and experiences of other kinds of time. There's a phrase, archaeo psychic time, or something like that, where, which is which, which which is Ballard getting to the kind of material that Rob was with. So I'm, I'm sure Rob must have, um, you know, fed off that. He couldn't be a science fiction writer of his generation without having been influenced by Ballard. No, I mean, you know, it's just that's just a given. <laughs> More questions? We have one just here.
Because of my work here as a folklorist and working here and on Middle European, there's a couple of points I want to raise that perhaps you haven't seen. Um, between the time of Marlborough and the end of the First World War, you talked before about the field of tartan, mm -hmm. but it's also the fact between Marlborough's time and the end of the First World War, the guys that were in the front line who did the charge first, who were the men who broke the other rank, were the forlorn hope. Yeah. That may have been two points that he raised there. Yeah. Um, also, we talked about writers who might influence him. The one strong book that came out from some of the points that you made that you didn't mention was Thomas Hardy's The Woodlanders where you get riddled with folklore, i.e. one of the characters who is born at the same time of, as an oak tree. He has the oak tree cut down, and when somebody tells him, he dies on the spot. <laughs> um, there's also an old traditional English story about three men who get lost in the forest and don't know what to do. And the first night, one man carves a woman out of a tree the second night, a man gives her breath. The third night, a man clothes her. And she walks off as they argue who she belongs to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. That's a lovely story. And that's actually the story of Gwyneth in Mythargo yeah. Wood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do we have any more questions? Three generations. Um, yes. I'm really curious to know if he had any any sort of spiritual or religious practice, because there is there's just the whole dream, the dream stuff, seems to indicate a, a real kind of deep spirituality. I don't know if that's the case or not. Could Sarah answer that? <laughs> Maybe just time for one more question. Or have we in fact finished on the bot on the dot of eight? Mm. Okay. Yes. Well I You want a last story? You want to tell a last story? It's not my story. Okay. Right. Um, anyway, <clears throat> Rob before before Sarah was married and was divorced and went to, as I understand it, a conference uh, somewhere on the continent. And he came down in the elevator and as he came down the elevator, he looks out and here's his ex-wife and another man, whereupon he says very loudly all across the lobby, that man stole my wife. <laughs> This was a wonderful kind of humor that he had. Mm. I mean, really, I'm sure you experienced it. I mean, don't I don't look know at me. How... It wasn't me. No, it wasn't you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how many of us would uh, uh, find that very humorous in that situation. But Rob, Rob, Rob was a very, very forgiving uh, person as well as uh, a very generous one. And uh, I, for one, certainly deeply miss him. As, as I guess many, mm. yeah. many, many people yeah. do. Um, thank you all for your attention. Thank you for my, my fellow family. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you all for a terrific evening. Thanks for a terrific evening. Do join us uh, in the bath, quick drink, and uh, pick up some books. <laughs>